Good day, folks. It's good to be back with you again. Uh, week zooming by as normal. Nothing to, nothing surprising there, right? Uh, all our busy weeks sometimes just seem to blend into one after another. Well, we're back at. Uh, oh, and thank you also for inviting me uh, into your places. Uh, we're back now on track. Uh, have been for a while now in our sermon series. In First Peter, we're calling it a living hope. And uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn to First Peter chapter three. That would be handy to do that ahead of time. Uh, so we're going to be looking at some other texts as well. Matthew's Gospel chapter, I think, twenty-six. You can put your finger there. Matthew's Gospel chapter five, and some of Paul's uh, letters as well. So hopefully you can keep up. Take some notes if you so des- so desire. So as I was looking at material this week, I came across a publication that was posted on a website called Reasons.org. And they had responded in this publication, ever so briefly though, but they responded to a question that was posed to them. And the question is this, why do atheists and skeptics spend so much of their time and energy passionately arguing against the existence of God? Now, there's a fellow there that is part of this organization that has this website, Reasons.org. His name is Hugh Ross. He's a believer and a scientist. And he responded uh, by sharing his experience when he was a speaker and a debater back a few years ago at a 2008 International Skeptic Society conference that was held in California. My first encounter with this idea or this group And there at this conference, there were five atheist scientists uh, who during the debate spoke with this kind of passion and intensity about the non-existence of the God of the Bible. Now, Ross, being the debater he is, according to this publication, responded to their comments by saying that their passion and intensity actually showed that they really did believe in the God of the Bible, but clearly, clearly they did not like him. And they responded to him by saying, It's not that we hate so much the God of the Bible, it's that we despise his followers. Now that is an interesting comment. So these atheist scientists, uh, according to this publication, went on to share some of their personal stories of how they had been wronged and even hurt by people who call themselves Christians. Again, Ross, being the debater that he is, I suppose, responded by saying, To them, how ironic it was and irrational that they would allow sinful humans to get between them and a morally perfect God. And then it was their turn to respond to Mr. Hugh Ross, and they said, and their their response is noteworthy again, we should pay attention. They said, if Christians understood how much damage they have caused, maybe they would behave differently. So what was Hugh's Uh, observation from this debate. What what should be our observation? Just this brief little introductory thing I've said. Well, he would go on to say that Christians need to behave differently if they want to see others come to faith in Christ. After all, are we not called to love one another and also to love and bless our enemies? Well, with all this in thought in mind, let's uh, turn to 1 Peter Uh, chapter 3, and we'll be reading from verse 8 to 12. If you remember, we went over this last week, if you were with us, and we're going to come back to this today and finish this off, this section off. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Verse 10, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to, the prayer, to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. And we just commit this time to you. O Holy Spirit, help us, mold us, and help us to understand and and what we should do with these things that we are learning in 1 Peter, and particularly here in these verses. So we commit this time to you, Lord. May you be glorified in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, as you probably figured out, we're continuing where we left off last week. We really spent our whole time last week just unpacking uh, chapter 3, verse 8. There, the apostle Peter was addressing, as we know, all believers. In other words, the body of Christ as a whole. We must remember, of course, that his letter wasn't written to us. It was written to believers that were dispersed in churches across five Roman provinces and that were, la- that were located in present-day Turkey. And to summarize, the Apostle Paul here dealt with the subject of what other commentators and I am calling a teamwork. Now, that might seem kind of odd uh, for, for a way, an odd way to describe verse 8, teamwork. And I would grant that, maybe so, but the Apostle Peter did say, all of you have unity of mind. So what, what did the Apostle mean here? Well, another way to translate the original language is to be of one mind. And last week we said uh, this means to have a common mindset. So certainly this, is, this has in view the idea of cooperation, the idea of collaboration, which is another way of saying teamwork. We also remember that these first century Christians were facing a a variety of trials for their faith in Christ. We don't have time to revisit uh, the details of what it looks like to have a life as a believer in and around the time this letter was written in the first century. But suffice it to say that these first century believers, uh, living living together in harmony was essential, very essential in the face of these trials for their faith in Christ. Hence, the Apostle Peter's exhortation here to have unity of mind. And when we have this kind of teamwork, and when it's attained and maintained, we even talked about that last week, it reveals something. It, 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 it manifests into something. And since we're using this word teamwork, we can say it reveals the team spirit, or the spirit, the core. The spirit of core. Now, a spirit of core is defined this way. It is a sense of unity, of common interests and responsibilities of a group of persons associated in a particular task or cause or enterprise. I think that kind of makes sense. I, I hope you understand that. And this team spirit, this the spirit of core in the body of Christ looks like something. It's evidence. And we learned last week in verse 8 that it looks like sympathy and brotherly love and a tender heart and, and a humble mind. Now, we're not going to rehash all those things. You can, you can go, do some work there on your own. This brings us now to verse 9. Let's read verse 9 together again. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Obtain a blessing. Please notice with me the phrase here, do not repay evil for evil. Kind of the key word we find in there is evil. Now, biblically, evil is applied in a number of ways. We'll just keep it to a couple. It's applied universally, for example, to describe something or someone with a bad nature. In other words, in the biblical context, with a fallen nature, a sinful nature. And the other way it's also seen, biblically, evil describes, uh, as one commentator put it, a mode of thinking, feeling, and acting. This is more in the, this is in the moral sense, I should say. Thinking and feeling and acting wrongly and badly or wicked. In the context as a whole of Peter's letter, specifically here in verse 9, the evil that the apostle was addressing here is in the moral sense. Morally objectionable behavior. We go to the Apostle Paul for some commentary. We go to his letter to the Galatian church, and he describes there how believers in the body of Christ, or in community, if you will, should feel, think, and act. Apostle Paul, concerned always with unity in the church, recognized that all believers will be challenged and tempted by what he called the desires of the flesh. In other words, our sinful human nature. Galatians 5.16, that's where you'll find this. Galatians 5.16. And what then are these desires of the flesh? Well, thankfully, Paul goes on to explain some of these things. The works of the flesh, he said, are evident. Sexual immorality, they're evident. You see them, you hear them, you know them. 
sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, <clears throat> drunkenness, orgies, and things like that. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. Now, that's quite a list, but it's not a comprehensive list because he said things like these. So how then should one think, feel, and act as a believer? We go back to Apostle Paul, Galatian letter. He reminded the Galatians, after giving this list of these, uh, uh, these, um, these things that the flesh desires, he said, walk by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 And in doing so, they would not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of flesh, Paul would say, are contrary to the desires of the Holy Spirit in a believer. No, my friends, a believer is to think and feel and act as so to manifest what? To reveal what? The fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's in Galatians 5.22. And this is not fruits. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit looks like this. According to Paul, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, and of course, self-control. So with this in mind, we consider now uh, the Apostle Peter here in the text, in the supporting text he uses uh, here in verse 9. Not in verse 9, but in his text here. The Apostle quoted King David in verse 10. The Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter. I'm going to use Paul and Peter. I'm going to mix them up. Hang in there. Apostle Peter Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. There, Peter, in verse 10, quoting from Psalm 34, verse 12 to 16. Back to verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. If you have the NIV, it translates, you know this translates uh, this particular words, reviling for reviling, insult for insult. Either translation, the sense here is slander. These are abusive words that we can say. Where Psalm 34 put it so well, speaking deceit, deceitful speech. Things like slander and gossip and lying, those kinds of things. These are abusive words intended to, you know, lie and falsely twist information to damage a person's character and name. Well, you know, obviously we've taken time to consider the impact of our words, not only last week, but briefly here in our behaviors as followers of Jesus. We've also considered the New Testament teaching around uh, these things as well. We have learned that our words and our behaviors uh, are more than just how we conduct ourselves in the good, bad, and ugly times of life. We've learned that our words and our behavior originate from within our hearts and in our minds. And frankly, when we're faced with hurtful words or behaviors from brothers or sisters in Christ or outside the body of Christ, our human nature wants to respond with anger often and often with bitterness or even insult for insult, reviling for reviling. The Apostle Peter said here, do not repay evil for evil, evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Apostle Peter's words here are striking. And I say that because think about the context of Peter's life. Think about the context of Peter's life. Do you remember Peter in Matthew's Gospel or in the book of Acts? Do you remember him? Or in the letter, some of the New Testament letters? Do you remember Peter, what he was like? Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 26 in your Bibles. Matthew 26. Uh, Give me a minute to get there myself. Matthew 26. And we're going to be looking specifically in the area of verse 36 to 56. And there Matthew records uh, for us um, Jesus and disciples while they, uh, while they were in a place that's called uh, Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Now Gethsemane is an actual place. It's a garden at the foot of Mount Olives in East Jerusalem. And here in Matthew's Gospel, here in Matthew 26, we find that after the Lord's Supper, Jesus and his disciples went to Gethsemane. 
And there we see that Jesus, along with Peter, James, and John, prayed three times. And after the third time, we see in this particular account, Matthew 26, 47 to 54, uh, that Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, came along with a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. And they arrested Jesus. And upon seizing Jesus, Matthew describes this in Matthew 26, 51. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. So who was this person that cut off the servant's ear? Well, the Apostle John in his Gospel describes for us who this person was. John's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 10 and 11. You can go there if you want. There, John writes this, Then Simon Peter, that's who this person was, Apostle Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And John even gives us the name of this high priest. The servant's name was Malchus. And on it goes, so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its sheath, shall I not drink the, the cup that the Father has given me? Back to the Apostle's letter here, First Peter. And here we encounter a disciple. Time has gone by. A disciple of Jesus has come a long way in his very own spiritual maturity and growth. Here was a disciple of Jesus by the name of the Apostle Peter who understood that revenge is best left with God. I hope you understand that. We go to the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Roman church. And there he said, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. And then he quotes from uh, the Old Testament. Paul said, For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Deuteronomy 32, 35. And then he was, goes on, and he, uh, Paul goes on, he says, to the contrary. And then he quotes again from the Old Testament, where he said, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you'll reap uh, burning coals on his head. Proverbs 25, 21, 22. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You find this in Romans chapter 12. We can turn now to the Sermon on the Mount again. Uh, again, for the first time. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, particularly verse 43 to 48. Let's read that together. Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48. Jesus said this. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so you may be sons of your Father who is in, your, who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So with all this in mind, uh, there's a question that is before us. When we are insulted or when someone hurts us, how do we respond? Well, moving along, we're back in verse 9. We want to look at verse 9b. Let's read that together. Verse 9b, the second half. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. So, instead of returning insult with insult, instead of seeking revenge, bless those who revile you. Bless those who insult you. Bless those who, Peter would say, are unjust toward you. Bless those, Peter would say here in verse 14 of chapter 3, when you suffer for righteousness' sake. Now you might be going, whoa, pastor, whoa, slow down a bit. This is getting a bit too much, a bit overboard. Why? Why bless those who persecute me? Why bless those who persecute me? Short answer, what the apostle Peter said, that you may obtain a blessing. That you may obtain a blessing. Now you're probably thinking, you might be thinking, I should say, I don't know, probably. You might be thinking, I can think of better and easier ways to get a blessing. And you might be right, but you might be wrong. I don't know. Let's, fi let's find out. So let's stop here before we go totally down a rabbit trail. Let's ask this question. What do you think blessing means? Of course, we've all heard people uh, talk about the good things in their lives as blessings. What are those good things 
that bless people. More often than not, do we not describe our blessings in concrete terms, such as our children, they bless us, our good health, that blesses us, our work, our homes. We say things like, she has a godly husband. What a blessing. Uh, what a blessing it was to have dinner with Bob. You pick somebody. Indeed, these are typical ways many describe their blessings. And of course, all these things are good gifts from God, who loves to give his children good gifts. And we should be grateful and thankful to God for these blessings. But there's a problem, mate. There's a problem. When you, uh, when you say you're blessed, when you finally got that job that you needed only to be let go two weeks ago, you might not think you're so blessed then. And there are those folks who mistakenly, and I repeat mistakenly, decide that they are not blessed because their health is bad or that a loved one is sick. How about we ask a different question? What is a blessing according to the Bible? Now we're going to stay particularly just in the New Testament. We don't have time to go through the Old Testament in this uh, survey. But briefly, a brief survey in the New Testament, there are two primary words translated as blessing. The first one could be translated as blessed or happy. And we find the, these, uh, this uh, shown to us in the Beatitudes of Matthew 5 and Luke 6, which describes there, well, uh, describes there, we'll be looking at some of those verses shortly, uh, which describes the blessed or the happy state of those who find their purpose and fulfillment in God in life. And as Psalms, uh, as the Psalms, including Psalm 34 here in our text, reminds us that our best life in this world is for those who fear and love God. As verse 11 reminds us, for those who seek peace and pursue it. Apostle Paul, again, we go back to him, in the fourth chapter of his letter to the Roman church, ties this kind of blessing, this kind of happy state to those whose sins have been forgiven and know that their relationship to God has been restored. Paul said, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Romans chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. There again, Paul quoting from the Old Testament, Psalm 32, 1 and 2. So that's one way that the New Testament uses the word, words translated blessing. The second primary uh, word used for blessing in the New Testament is transliterated, and I'll try and say this to you. This one here I do want to share. You logeo. You logeo. This is translated here in the USV, which I'm using, uh, but on the contrary, bless. This is in the verb form, and that you may obtain a blessing. That's in the noun form. The focus here is more on the good words or the good report that others give someone. And on a side note, in case you're wondering, this word is where we get our English word eulogy, where we speak well of one who has died. Let's go back to Apostle Paul, to his Ephesian letter, chapter 1, verse 3. Paul there said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Here is a way that we can give good words about God. Back to the Apostle Paul. I already said that. And we now come back full circle to verse 9, where the Apostle Peter exhorted his believers to bless those who mistreat them, because for this you are called that you may obtain a blessing from God. So a short summary is needed, and it's best uh, said by a commentator who said this, quote, statements of blessings are a wish from, for God to restore his favor, favor or others, on others, on others, or a declaration of his inherent goodness. So in summary, the Apostle Peter in the New Testament in, con, in, in its, all of its context teach believers that blessing is God's favor or an extending of his grace, his mercy. And of course, we know this begins with the forgiveness of our sins. As the Apostle Peter put it in his letter here, in the first chapter, if you remember, first chapter, chapter uh, verse 3, he said, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We go back to the, Roman, to the letter to Rome, to the Roman church. In Paul's letter there, he said, Blessed is a man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Romans chapter 4, 7, and 8. 
We already looked at that. That's a quote from Psalm 32, 1 and 2. And if you think about this, if you think about this, my brothers and sisters, my friends, you and I are unbelievably blessed of God in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. That's a great, great blessing. But there's more. See, God's blessings are not primarily the temporary earthly benefits that he gives believers. Those are good gifts, yes. However, as believers seek after God, blessings come to them. For example, the psalmist said, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek after him with their whole heart. Psalm 119.2 uh, Solomon, in his wisdom, said, Blessed is the one who listens to me. Speaking of God, of course, Proverbs 8, 34. And we could go on and on through the word of God, blessing after blessings, as believers purposely seek after God. Yes, God gives good gifts, but God is the greatest of all blessings, is he not? Well, we do need to get down to the nitty and gritty. The nitty gritty is what? Well, when one suffers. Because that's the theme of First Peter. That's a major theme here. Yes, God's blessings are also specifically related, my friends, to suffering. For example, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, 4. He went on to say, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for, righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verse 10. How about when someone insults you or persecutes you or insults a believer and persecutes a believer? Jesus went on to say, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when that happens. And we see the New Testament writers echoing this. For example, James echoes what Jesus said in Matthew 5. In uh, James chapter 1, verse 2, James said, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Well, when you think about this, how hard this is and how different than the culture around us. Yet how profound and a great comfort to the mourner, to the persecuted. You see, friends, in suffering, God blesses. And some of you who are listening to this, know what I'm talking about. You've experienced this kind of suffering. Or you know someone who has. You have experienced it or you know someone who has. And you might have a question in the quietness of your heart. But why must it be through suffering? And why must it be through suffering? Isn't there an easier way to be blessed? Well, we should be quite frank here. We desire his blessings, don't we? But deep down, we're afraid. We want financial security, a decent home, happy and healthy kids or grandkids, for everyone to live a long life, go on a holiday maybe for once in a while, have that great job. These, my friends, are the kinds of things that our hearts desire more, more often than not, than the God who gives these blessings. We need to understand this. Left to our own devices, our stubborn and sinful hearts would try to do life in its own strength, in its own wisdom. Left to our own devices, we would search for security and the love that we crave and the happiness that we want in all of the very wrong places. See, God wants his children to lean on him in him alone, to depend on him and him alone. Nahum the prophet said this, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. Again, we need to be frank. We won't take refuge in him unless we lean, learn, not lean, unless we learn, yes we lean, learn that our financial securities, our relationships, our health, all those are not reliable and dependable sanctuaries to park our lives. And we shouldn't be upset or we shouldn't be irate that God then leads us down our hard road. Yes, suffering itself, we know, is not a blessing. And it's not the only way to know God 
in deeper ways. Yet, in God's economy, blessings often come through pain. It's in the painful trials of life that we learn, as Solomon said, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. When life is not only bad, but downright ugly, I pray we learn that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Psalm 46, 1 and 2. And friends, when, when, not if, we are insulted, when all kinds of evil are said of us because of our faith in Jesus, remember these words of our Lord and Savior, who said, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. Dear friends, let us pray. Father, I thank you. Oh Lord, I pray for my the people that are listening to this, I pray, God, that you would bless them. Bless them with your assurance that you are with them every step of the way. If they're not your child, if they have not uh, confessed their faith and trust in Christ, have not repented of their sins and turned to you, Lord, I pray, God, they would do so. I pray those of us who are followers of Jesus, who have become cold and stubborn and trusting in our own strength, that we would repent also. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for you are good indeed all the time to your children. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.